you will get a second opportunity, Deputy Cullinan. Our mothers, um, I think we all need second and third uh, opportunities. There's so much that we could talk about and so many questions we'd have for uh, the witnesses. And I want to uh, uh, thank them for their presence. Um, you said earlier on, and rightly so, Mr O'Brien, that you could not be expected to be across the detail of what's happening in every hospital, and nor would, would I expect you, but luckily for me I am in, in respect of University Hospital Waterford, um, and uh, I put down parliamentary questions almost every week to keep myself acquainted with what is happening there. So I want to use the examples of what is happening in Waterford, because I'm familiar with them, to frame questions uh, which have a, a national implication, um, if I can. And I'll start with uh, outsourcing patients, uh, where patients who are on waiting lists in certain hospitals are outsourced to other hospitals because capacity simply is not there in those hospitals. So one of the responses I got back to a parliamentary question on outsourcing in University Hospital Waterford was that in 2013, the total number of uh, patients who were outsourced, this is o OPD outsourced patients, was 3,085. And that had increased to 6,203 by 2015, and in fact has gone up again in 2016. So that's a 100% increase in the number of patients who are being outsourced. Has your organisation done a cost analysis of does it cost more to outsource patients in the first instance? There certainly will be a cost that possibly is not uh, being taken into account by the patient who will have to travel and incur costs, but by the organisation uh, is there a greater cost? And secondly, when patients are outsourced, how is that paid for? Is it paid for by the hospital that refers them? or is it paid for by the hospital that provides the treatment? And bear in mind that many of the patients who are outsourced are outsourced to private facilities in different parts of the state as well. I have the Matter Private in Cork here, St Francis Private Hospital, uh, Beacon Hospital, Sandyford, Barrington's Hospital, Oteven Hospital, Whitfield Hospital. So most of the outsourcing has been done to private hospitals. So my question is obvious. There's a greater number of patients being outsourced in the hospital in my own area um, and are being outsourced to private hospitals. So have you done any cost analysis, if you can comment on that in respect of uh, the cost effectiveness of, of that? Yeah. Um, thank you for the, the thoughtful and informed question. The uh, practice of treating patients elsewhere other than the primary hospital is often generally referred to outsourcing. We tend to refer, use that term only for into the private sector, but I know locally they think of outsourcing even if it goes to another public hospital, and I think the total figures that you use encompass both. Yeah. Um, where we have capacity to meet an unmet need in one hospital, in another hospital, we regard it as good practice to utilise the resources of the second hospital. And for example, recently there would have been a significant uh, shift of uh, provision of service in orthopaedics from Waterford to Kappa in order to deal with a long-term waiting list issue. And more recently, uh, in the cardiac area, uh, Cork University Hospital has been addressing the needs of some longer waiters as well. And that is clearly uh, increasing the efficient use of the public resource. Um, and is always beneficial both to the patients and to the system. Where there is what we essentially regard as outsourcing, which is to the private sector, uh, that is always done on the basis of, a, of, a, of, an, of an appropriately procured service and best value for money is obtained. But most importantly, the driver of that is to ensure that patients who are in need of outpatient assessment and or inpatient or day case treatment that they wouldn't otherwise get in a timely way do get it. And so overall we do regard that as offering value. And, and I accept that. Can I just first of all accept, obviously in situations where we have spare capacity in public hospitals in one area, and I would imagine this is part of the logic of groups that have been established as well, yes. it would make sense for hospital for patients, if they're waiting longer in one hospital, if there's capacity in another public hospital for them to be seen there. And it's so not there's, there's necessarily spare capacity, it could be a redistribution. A redistribution, but, in, 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 but I, I can see the logic to it. Yeah. So what I'm, what in I'm, order to equalise waiting yeah. times. Yeah. What I'm trying to understand though is, in situations then where we do not have capacity, and you mentioned orthopaedics as one example, but there are many examples, not just 
just in Waterford, but across all public hospitals where there are capacity issues and patients are then being treated in private hospitals. Have you done any cost analysis on, uh, in terms of would it not be better uh, to put the capacity into those hospitals to enable those hospitals to treat those patients rather than having to pay for those patients being treated in private hospitals? Not from a patient perspective, because that is important. I, I, I would always put myself in the shoes of a patient. Most people don't want to travel. But even from a cost perspective, and you're the accountable officer uh, to us, has, has your organisation done an analysis uh, of the cost of treating patients in private hospital as opposed to actually putting the capacity into the public hospitals? Yeah, in, general, in general, it is uh, preferable to treat at marginal cost patients in public hospitals where we're not having to pay overhead charges and, and so on. But typically where this occurs, it's because there isn't really an option to increase capacity. So typically... My, my question with respect is, yeah. I don't want to interrupt because I did ask a, a direct question yes. and um, with the limited time we have, it would be better if we could get the direct responses. Have you done a cost analysis? Yes, but we take into account in that whether there is a practical reality about providing the service from the public hospital. So, for example, if we have a long-term vacancy for a rare specialty consultant that we haven't been able to fill, then there isn't really a good public sector benchmark that you can use because there isn't a reality about having that, having that available. So, would there be a greater cost on the state uh, that patients, some patients are being treated in private hospitals. In, um, in some cases, the unit cost can be higher, yes. yes. But that's not a necessarily a generalisable statement, but there will be circumstances. Could you furnish, the, if you have done a cost analysis, then could you furnish this committee with examples of that cost analysis? We will provide you with an example of a couple of specialties where we've outsourced Thank you. and where we can give you comparison. In relation to another area that causes some people concern is the increase in agency spend. And again, I'll give you two examples in University Hospital of Waterford because they have those figures. In 2012, the total agency spend by the hospital was 1,648,000. In 2013, 3,597,000. In 2014, 6,289,000. Reduced slightly in 2015 to 5,145,000, but went back up closer to 6 million in 2016. So from 2012, where it was 1.6 million, up to 2016, where it was 6 million, is a very significant, a significant increase in agency spent. Again, is that costing us more as taxpayers in terms of having to hire agency staff as opposed to direct employment in the public service? Certainly the in-year cost can be higher. The long-term cost may not be because of the impact of long-term pensions and so on. But our preference... <laughs> Uh, is that agency should only be used at the margins. There will always be some requirement for agency. And indeed, all of our hospitals have a conversion target in year, which Stephen could speak to in greater detail. Would you accept then that it's more than on the margins if you have in one hospital 1.6 million oh, yeah. in 2012 and 6 million three years later would be not just on the margins? Yeah, the they're, entire... being forced, they're being forced to do this, which you not accept, because they simply don't have the capacity uh, in the public system. Maybe it was because in the past recruitment problems, uh, embargo, I don't know, or, but whatever the, the, the reasoning for it, uh, there was a quadrupling of agency spend at University Hospital of Waterford. So yeah, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand, is that costing us more as a taxpayer? So, um, Deputy, typically at the moment, overall, uh, if you look at our total pay cost, it's about 5% agency. Um, which we prefer it not to be. Where it's most worrying is in medical costs, where it's more like 14% of our total pay cost is agency. And while I don't have the specific figures for Waterford, I would hazard a guess that it's an increase in medical agency is a large part of the driver. And generally speaking, for I can say for almost any grade, uh, the cost of agency versus the cost of flat rate hours, the normal hours, uh, is definitely higher so it's definitely higher. That's all it needed to know. That's, about, but, that's we, but in terms of why it's there, it's yeah. typically because we can't recruit. Yeah. So yeah. there is a market issue there. If, if people aren't in the market or aren't making themselves available for permanent roles, 
hospitals are often and, and I dealt, I dealt with that with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform who tells me there is no difficulty with recruitment in the public service but in any event in certainly in health there seems to be in some in some areas but that, that's but we, I, all I needed to, to, to know was that there is a greater cost and, and that's been acknowledged I right. should say deputy that compared to overtime rates yeah. so I said it's, it's definitely more yeah. expensive for agency yeah. compared to flat rates in terms of overtime rates, it depends on the grade and depends on the age. And again, if you've done any cost analysis on that, if you could for furnish this committee with that, that would be helpful we can in terms of agency of that, okay. I want to also move to a third issue then. And again, I want to stick with University Hospital Waterford because it's one I'm familiar with. And I'm trying to understand, Mr O'Brien, and I did signal I would put this to you before uh, this uh, meeting so that I, I wouldn't be putting the issue blind to you. I'm trying to understand the relationship between policy, which you are not here to answer for, that's an, an issue for the Minister, I'm aware of that, and then operational matters and cost, how, how those issues are funded. And if I can give an example, which I've been following for some time with interest, and I still am not in a position to understand process, is the deployment of a mobile cat lab to treat cardiac patients at University Hospital Waterford. My understanding is that a business, first of all, there was an announcement made uh, by the Minister in January that this would happen. Then later on, a couple of weeks later, a business case was developed by the hospital management. That was then sent to the hospital group, which is the South South West Hospital Group. The group then, I think, sent it to either the HSE or the department or both. Um, that was in January. Four months passed, nothing happened. No decision was made. Uh, at the time that that business model was developed, we had um, 580 patients waiting for cardiac procedures. Uh, then the hospital entered into a service level agreement with hospitals in Cork, and 380, I think, of those patients are now being seen uh, in Cork University Hospital and a private hospital, I think, in uh, Cork. Okay? So bear with me in terms of the process here. I just want to understand the process. Uh, so at the time when this was needed most, when the business case was made, when the demand was greater, no decision was made. Even though the minister, it seems, had made the decision that the, the hospital wasn't given the approval to go through to the procurement stage. Um, we're now being told, I've been told today, that they have or will be given that approval next week. And then that, that will uh, involve a, a procurement process. I'm trying to understand the relationship between policy and decision making. So my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that a minister could make a policy decision that the deployment of a mobile lab could be one of a number of options used to reduce cardiac uh, care. Would it then be up to the HSE and the department to then make an operational decision as to whether or not that is necessary at any given time. Who would in, just if you can explain to me the decision-making processes here? Who's responsible for what? Yeah. <laughs> and I want to get to procurement as well because that's sure. the real reason I'm asking this. Is we'll get to the procurement end of it in a second. Okay. But just in terms of process, if you can help me. The, the process here, as you know, includes the Herity report, which looked at the demand capacity, demand versus capacity issues for cardiac catheterisation for, for the population served by Waterford University Hospital and recommended that that capacity should be increased to achieve equilibrium between likely demand and likely capacity going into the future. Since that time, the Minister identified as a policy priority, as he is entitled to, that that capacity should become equalised. And in order to do that, we have been commencing the process of seeking to recruit the required additional staffing to enable the hours of operation of the existing cardiac cath lab to be extended. That's likely, for some of the reasons we discussed earlier around agency staff and recruitment, to be a longish process. The practical way in which uh, capacity can be increased in the meantime is by bringing on site a private provider providing both staff and a temporary additional cardiac cath lab. As I said, this has been identified as a ministerial priority. Um, at group level, they have sought to deal with the accrued backlog in the way that you've described 
through patients travelling to CUH and, as you've agreed, a significant number of patients who otherwise wouldn't have been treated now have been. And as a result of that, uh, a procurement process, and I won't talk about that until you've asked your questions, is shortly going to commence to give effect to the provision of a temporary deployment of a mobile staffed cardiac catheterization laboratory for a brief period to University Hospital Waterford. And what would that procurement process involve? Because there seems to be, and I'm going to get to the ongoing issues, that there seems to be with compliance with procurement rules within the HSE. We have, uh, we've, we've had, uh, I don't know how many uh, examples where the Controller and Auditor General has given a qualified uh, um, 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 reporting of accounts because of uh, instances of breaches of procurement rules in the HSE. He, but in terms of this, in this instance here, talk me through now what will happen in terms of procurement. Yeah, just, just to be clear, I don't think the controller has qualified his audit cert. He's included a matter of emphasis, which yes. is a different okay. process. Um, but you, you know the point I, I to make with respect to them, Mr. O'Brien. In this case, uh, fortunately, this is not the first time we've deployed cardiac catheterization mobile units and consequently we have a framework in place, a valid framework. And what a framework provides is for a number of pre-qualified suppliers, each of whom, when you wish to draw down, are invited to take part in what's colloquially called a mini competition. So they're pre-qualified through open tender to take part in a mini competition against each other. And it is intended uh, within the next few days to commence that mini competition within the framework. So that will be validly procured. If that were subsequently included in the sampling by the CNAG, uh, subject to the view that he will reach, I would be satisfied that it would be deemed to be procurement compliant, provided they follow all the steps correctly as they should. And in terms of, and I just want to, if I can't just deal with the national issue now of, of cardiac care, because that's important to me as well. Uh, in 2004, there was a review of services in Dublin. Isn't yes. that correct? Yes. And what was the outcome of that review? Well, there's clearly a, a requirement for additional capacity in Dublin. Yes. What was the outcome of the review? What recommendations were made? Well, although you gave me notice we'd be talking about Waterford earlier, uh, that wasn't sufficient time for me to review the Dublin okay. report. Okay, but you, did, you are aware that there was a review in, yes. in, in Dublin, yeah. and you might also then be aware that following the review in Dublin, the HSE decided to, and the department decided to carry out a national review. Isn't that correct? Correct. When was that decision made? Oh, back then. Which is when? It's subsequent to 2014, probably 2015. But 20, I, so it was in 2015. I would, I would qualify yeah. all of these remarks by reference to that, I haven't recently reviewed this matter, so my, I'm operating off memory, which could be slightly deficient. Well, I have a, um, a letter here which, which um, was sent by uh, Joan Reagan, in Acute Hospitals Policy Division 3, to Professor Harris when his, he was doing his work, and it says that following the Dublin review, we, we have asked the ACS programme to review the current arrangements for the provision of PPCI nationally and to make recommendations. This was in 2015. It is intended that the review will be completed in three months. That never happened. But then the programme for government came where a Waterford review had to be done. That was done, as you know. Uh, somebody was commissioned to do a body of work. And it then goes on to say that it will be necessary to bring forward the Waterford element of the review. However, it will be important to ensure that the results of the Waterford, Waterford review feed in as appropriate to the national review. So would your understanding then be that we had a review in Dublin. Following that, the HSE decided we'll do a national review. There was a programme for government commitment specific to Waterford. That review is done, and now we have the outcome of that, and that will feed into this national review. So is that national review at the moment underway? Are you aware of whether that's underway? That would be being commissioned by the department, and I'm not aware. Can you furnish this committee with, um, with that information? I, I can certainly inquire of the department, yes. Can you inquire of the department? And also, not just that, but in terms of, is, is there a terms of reference for who will carry out this review? Well, I'll inquire and provide you with all the information that I'm provided with. with the, yes, but well, I, I'm asking for specific information. Well, so, Ray, this, Ray, Ray behind me is taking notes. So, if, if Ray is listening to specific information, Ray's I'm, always listening. I'm asking for, uh, with respect, is there is uh, I, there is references to a national review. I'm not sure whether that has commenced or not. 
Obviously, in any national review of services, whatever the outcome of the review is, it could cost us more money or it could cost us less money. There could be improved services or reduced services in different areas and will have an impact on hospital budgets and so on. So, obviously, hospitals will be anxious to know and patients and people in different regions will be anxious to know when there is a review, when it's going to happen, what its terms of reference will be and, and so on. I do not have that information yet, despite several attempts to get that information. So through your good office, Mr O'Brien, if I could be given that information, if you can get as much information as you can from me, that would be very helpful. Well, I'll, I'll certainly make the inquiries on your behalf. Okay. Um, I also just want to, my last, and I'll come in on a second time, I just want to deal with the issue of um, Section 38 and 39 organisations, um, Mr O'Brien. The very first meeting of the Public Accounts Committee I attended was the uh, one we dealt with the internal audit in Tucansol. You might remember uh, that hearing, Mr. O'Brien. And there was, there was, uh, I think, up to 80 findings in that uh, report, all of which were flagged as high priority. And you might remember as well that there was a reference to because of the nature of the issues that were raised that the internal auditors at the time said that it raises systemic problems for the HSE in terms of its relationship with these organisations and service level agreements. Since then we have had Glen, St John of Gods and so on. So the problem doesn't seem to have uh, gone away. Uh, so what I'm asking is, since we had that meeting with you, since internal auditors reported on console, since they flagged that there could be systemic problems, uh, now we have other problems in relation to other Section 38 and 39 organisations. What improvements in process have been made by the HSE to make sure that we don't have these type of situations happening over and over again? Because we don't want, with respect Mr O'Brien, to be dealing with these issues over and over. It's taxpayers' money. So I have a number of specific questions and I'll put the questions to you. In terms of Glen, was that funded? by the HSE. And uh, I'll get to questions in terms of St John of God earlier, that, that is funded, and um, I'll get to some of those uh, questions. But in terms of changes subsequent to the internal audit report into console, what changes, are, if any, have been made by your organisation in terms of governance? So, Deputy, um, we have instituted, as I referenced earlier, the extension of the annual compliance statement process to the larger of the Section 39 organisations. So it, that annual compliance statement is where the board and chair of the voluntary body has to provide a list of assurances to us around governance, risk management and a variety of things. It started in 2014 with 38s. It's now been extended for 2016 uh, to the over 3 million per annum Section 39s, which is about a 4 or 55 uh, organisations. Uh, I'd have to check in terms of the exact timing, but we are, we've also instituted, as I mentioned, the external review by Deloitte of those um, uh, Section 38 organisations. I'm fairly certain that we've at least brought forward the completion date of that external review, which had been to the end of 2018 to the end of 2017. Um, we have also written to all board chairs uh, based on a number of internal audit reports and advising board chairs uh, and their boards of some common issues that have been appearing around uh, those internal audit reports. And we are currently seeking to improve our capacity within our CHOs, as I mentioned, to make sure they have sufficient resource to be able to engage more frequently where that's a problem with some of the voluntary organisations, given that there's over 2,000 of them in total. Well, given that I have limited time um, here today, and I appreciate the answer you've given, Mr Valvani, would it be possible again to furnish this committee with a report on what changes have been made to the interaction with oversight of and the relationship with Section 39 nations, organisations from a, government's pers a governance perspective between the HEA and those organisations since the console internal audit report, specifically from that time onwards, what changes were made if you can furnish this copy with a report? Deputy, we have given a briefing in the papers that we've submitted, but we can look at it again in terms of the specific timeline you're looking for and yes. forward from there. Mr. Yes. Brian, will it be possible to get that? 
Yes, yes, it will. Okay, and on the St John of God's then, it told HSE auditors it was common practice for state-funded 38 uh, agencies to top up executive salaries, often from private sources, and that the, HSE, that the HSE was specifically aware at the time the order paid supplemental pay to employees. Is that correct? Uh, going back to the full audit, we identified through audit work a, a wide range of voluntary bodies in the Section 38 space that were making additional payments or top-ups, to use the colloquial, colloquial phrase, and a significant pay policy exercise was undertaken which required all of them to come back into line. The committee itself was heavily involved with one Section 38, a particular hospital in Dublin, which members may recall. There is now an audit following uh, uh, an internal whistleblow that's concerning the way in which certain individuals at St John of God's had their pay regularised. Members may, may be familiar with what's alleged, and a significant forensic internal audit has been carried out, um, which is almost complete in the sense that the, the feedback process is underway now. But that report isn't yet. And can I just put the process to you, Mr. Um, O'Brien, in terms of what I have here to make sure that I am not incorrect in any way? So there was a, a direction in 2013 from the HSE which banned top-up payments. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and it became necessary then for all charities to regularise their matters and to ensure that no non-exchequer funding was used to supplement approved rates of pay. Well, not, Is that all not all charities, all Section 38. All Section 38, 39, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Not all. 38s. Yes. But, yeah. yeah, that's correct. 39s aren't subject to public pay policy. Yeah. Uh, the St John of God said at the time that this could have serious implications for the order, order's funding due to contractual terms and future pension risk of the employees. Do you get back again? Is that correct? Well, just just while I'm on it, I'm nearly finished. Just, with, yeah, with, with just I can even for, I'll forego my second time if I can just finish this this time. Okay. Because I'm, I'm, nearly, I'm nearly finished. Okay, that sounds a good offer. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, uh, St John of God said at the time that this could have serious implications for the order's funding due to contractual terms and future pension risk of the employees. Would you have been informed by St John of God that that was a, a concern of theirs? My, my understanding is they didn't say that to us. They did not. There's that's no my, evidence that they said it to you. That's my understanding. Now, this is all the subject of an internal audit. The information I have, Mr O'Brien, is that the HSE rejected these arguments and opposed the ban on top-up payments, but you're telling me that that wasn't rejected because the request wasn't made. And what, I, what I'm saying to you is that's not my information, but there is a full forensic audit yes. report um, which is currently in the feedback phase. In other words, the individuals concerned are now commenting back to internal audit on that, and that report will therefore be finalised very shortly. And, and is it not the case then that St John of God said that it found 139 cases of non-compliance since last December? Are you aware of that? So, um, Just in terms of the questions, uh, one of your questions was St John of God said something, is that true? It's a separate matter as to did St John of God submit yes. a business case yeah. in response to the September 13 issue of public pay policy? I'm only interested in what, what, what they would have said to you. What, or what they would have said to the, or what, what interaction there was between St John of God as an organisation and the HSE. So I think that they obviously will, they obviously say certain things that may or may not be true. Yeah. What you can do here is then uh, help us in saying, actually, no, that did not happen, so, as Mr. So, Bryan says. So what I can help you with, Deputy, is yeah. in response to the September 13 general issue of the department's documented pay policy to all the Section 38s. I have no doubt that St John of God, along with others, submitted business cases to seek regularisation, and there would have been an output to that process. I don't have the output today. Subsequently, in December 16, our National HR Division also uh, wrote to all the Section 39s, outlining, reminding them of the pay policy, and outlining a process by which any residual regularisation issues should be again put forward in a business case format. And I've no doubt St John of God's were also uh, someone who contributed, who made a submission. So whatever they made inside those submissions is what they've certainly said to the HSE. Um, so Thank that, you. And that my final you. point then, uh, one final uh, point, and it's a question and a point, uh, quite here, look, is that my understanding is that St John of God recently wrote to the Department of Health 
pleading poverty and seeking €7 million Euro in additional funding, despite the fact that it is being alleged, and Mr O'Brien said this is being examined, that there was €6 million Euro in secret payments made to senior executives within, within that organisation. Um, is that an accurate description of the allegation that's been made, Mr O'Brien? And uh, would you be prepared to comment on that? Well, the, the allegation is that privately or secretly or whatever way we care to characterise it, St John of God's made undisclosed substantial payments to 14 senior managers from their point of view in order to ensure what they regarded as contractual obligations were discharged. The issue from our point of view is non non disclosure and whether that was that in compliance with with rules Sorry? Was that in, were they in compliance, were they in contravention of any rules by doing that? That's what the audit is going to determine. Um, it's certainly not in, it's not on the face of it in compliance with public pay policy. There is a separate discussion uh, initiated by the same organisation about their viability as a provider of Section 38 of services, and we are in process with them in relation to that. Thank you. Okay.